we're going to talk about how to create a successful paid marketing campaign. The agenda will be to talk about the kind of traffic you can possibly get, understanding how to track your conversions using some of the tools that T can offer. We're going to dive into the formula that I put together and I'll explain how to use it. Then I'll tell you how you can hire either us or do it in-house and do the optimization yourself. Basically what it takes from A to Z to do this whole paid marketing campaign. To get started, everyone is probably going to be in a different situation as far as where they are with their marketing campaign. I speak to clients all the time who either are for paid traffic or against paid traffic and all about organic. If you are fortunate enough to get a lot of organic traffic and not even bother with paid, not everybody is in that position, especially if you're just starting out a paid campaign. And what you really have to look, regardless if you have organic or paid campaign, is, is the traffic really converting? Even if you're getting 100 free visitors and only one is converting, what's happening to the other 99 and why are you leaving money on the table? Because if you were able to convert the other 99 or at least some of them, then maybe you could afford a paid marketing campaign. And if you are doing a paid marketing campaign, where is your money going to? Because a lot of times you just pay the agency or somebody that you're outsourcing it to and you might, again, be fortunate enough to see a return on your investment, but are you really getting 100% of what you can get you're spending money already, why not get the rest of it? So what kind of marketing is paying off? Where is the traffic coming from? Is it coming from Google? Is it coming from email marketing? Is it coming from somewhere else? The question that I want to answer here is some people will say, well, should I start with organic or paid marketing? And why would you try to really spend money doing organic if you don't even know if it's going to pay off because organic can send you free traffic, but actually ranking organically is not free. You still have to pay someone or do it yourself and bring the traffic in. And what happens when you bring the traffic in after three months and that particular word that's responsible for bringing the traffic is not converting as well as you hoped. Now you lost time, money, and it's not really benefiting your business. So if it is paying off, the question is, why is it paying off? How good is your sales funnel? Are you really confident that if you were to go tomorrow and spend $100,000 on advertising, that your sales funnel is that good? Or did you just get lucky and you found that little keyword that's really converting? And if you're going to start buying more words, they're not going to convert, which is why the marketing will fail. So you really have to kind of understand the fact that maybe you got lucky with getting the traffic at the moment or if you're confident that you can replicate that traffic, you know, that also has to come into the picture as far as what's working, what's not working. And if you're just starting out, which means you have no activity. So really the first two points is before you start any kind of new marketing, right? Sometimes we are successful with organic traffic and we want to do paid marketing and we just take a thousand or five thousand dollars, put it into Google and see if it works and it doesn't work and then we get upset and we stop doing it. But if you already have organic traffic, what is that look like? You know, is that organic traffic converting or not? And if you have a paid traffic, then again, what does that look like? If you're starting from zero and you have no traffic at all, you may have to take a risk and pay for paid traffic, knowing that you're going to probably lose that money that you invest to get the data that's needed in order to understand if your card marketing is working or not. The last thing that we need to understand with your current marketing is why it's not working. Is it because you have a broken sales funnel or is it because you have bad traffic? I have clients that would have me review their website and they're saying, well, I'm not converting, but I have 200 visitors coming in per day. Why are they not converting? And I'm looking at their visitors and they're all having poor engagement while the customer really tried to create a great experience on the website. So... To him, it seems like his business is failing, but to me, the way I see it is you're buying the wrong type of traffic. It's the same thing with our other company, Shopping Court Elite. We're not the cheapest and we're not the most expensive, but if I was buying traffic for those people that are looking for the cheapest solution, they're all going to leave and I'm going to have poor engagement. Does that mean that I have a bad website? No, it means I'm buying the wrong kind of traffic. And as far as bad conversions go, well, maybe I am buying the right kind of traffic, but my website, when we had our old shopping cart website, 
we were getting good traffic, but they weren't really engaging because the website didn't justify the functionality that we were offering and the price that we were trying to sell it for. So as soon as we changed the look and feel of our company, all of a sudden that same traffic, we changed nothing, started to convert a lot better. So to sum up this slide, what is happening now on your website? And if it's good, what exactly is working? Is it because you have a really good source or do you have a really good sales funnel or do you have both? To be honest, I've never seen both unless somebody actually worked on both. And that's why we're having this webinar so I can kind of show you what you need to look out for. That's where the formula is going to come in. I'm going to show you the formula and, and explain it. And if something is not working, your website, you feel like it's failing you. What exactly is failing you? Is it the traffic? Or is it the conversions? Because here is a client, I'm going to show you an example that I was doing some consulting recently. He was averaging two, three orders a day, but he has a lot of traffic coming in. And there's a lot of good traffic. So what he kept thinking is I need more traffic to make more sales. So if we go to details right now, and by the way, this is the threat engagement analytics tool that we're looking at. So if we go to details and we're going to just look at the 1st of February, we had 116 excellent engaged visitors and only two sales, right? So what happened to those 114? This particular client was saying, let's get more traffic. And I was saying, let's not get more traffic. Let's get better conversions on the traffic you already have. Why do we need to buy more traffic just so we don't convert any more of it? Because according to this ratio, we're going to have to get 116 more highly engaged people to make an extra two sales. It doesn't make any sense. Because if our conversions were healthy, then we should be making 10 or even 20 sales without getting any more traffic. This is why you need to understand what your picture looks like, because sometimes you're set on getting more traffic when that is really not the case. You don't need more traffic. You just need better conversions. So moving on, understanding conversions. You could have, and I honestly think that this is probably the number one reason why websites don't perform as well as they can. And that is because there is a broken sales funnel. What do I mean by that? First, I covered this in my previous webinar. If you go to our YouTube channel, you could find the YouTube channel by going to shoppingcartelite.com. And all the way on the bottom, there is a YouTube link on social media. And if you end up on our channel, it's on their webinars. So every webinar that I'm going to be doing, I'll just post it here a few weeks later. So it's not going to go there instantly. So if you want to listen in on the webinar, just make sure you join in when I do them. This one covered engagement versus sales. I went in depth on why engagement are more important than, than sales because engagement leads to a sale. So going back here, when you are selling a product, for example, diapers, somebody who is shopping for diapers, they probably read out that's why they're looking for it now online and they needed it yesterday. So they will make that purchase right there and then and you don't have to worry about it. If you're selling, let's say, computers, that person might need a week before making a decision to buy a computer, which means all the traffic that you're getting today, you're not converting until seven days from now. This is a similar situation that we have with our other company, Shopping Cart Elite. That could take as long as six months before a sale occurs. I would probably say if I had to put a number on it, I don't have the exact number, but if I had to make a number, I would say that 90, 95% of websites focus on these impulsive buys. Send the customer to the product page and let's hope that he makes the purchase. So what is the problem with that? The problem is exactly what this client was experiencing, that he was getting 116 buyers that could have bought his product, but he was only converting two of them. It's the same story on every website. The issue here is that you might not have any proof that you have a broken sales funnel, but Threat Engagement Analytics confirms that you have a broken sales funnel by showing you that, look, you have engagement, you have very little sales, you have a problem with your sales funnel. To kind of, and some people can't really do this, usually when you have somebody who's working your conversion ratio optimization, he will try to get into the customer's shoes and imagine what he's experiencing and basically what he would do, you can potentially do is go to T, click on one of these excellent engaged visitors. He spent a minute, 33 actions, and you actually click on show screenshot, which will render you a screenshot showing you what he did. And you can actually go to the page and repeat what he did with the mouse movement and try to experience what he experienced. Again, if you have no activity, 
then you need to buy the traffic to get that activity. So a lot of advertising agencies will tell you that, look, if you're a brand new website and you have no traffic, let's not focus on organic traffic. Let's just buy some traffic and see what happens, right? And sometimes it fails, the customer gets upset, but it's not the agency's fault. It's, you know, we need some data to work with. So here's a screenshot, you know, the mouse starts off here and he's scrolling up and down, up and down. Seems like he's just looking for something specific to buy. And this one I would say is not a Windows shopper, but a poor product selection that he ended up on this page looking for something specific and he couldn't find it. So anyway, if you have no activity, then you need to invest money into getting this data. If you do have that activity and you're seeing that your engagement is not justified on the sales, then you have a broken sales funnel. So what can be done on the sales funnel? Two things. Let's cover the sales copy first before we jump in if the sales copy is not going to work out. Sales copy is probably the number one reason why people leave. And if we go back to this particular client, we can see that on that day, he had 300 bypassers, 77 potential customers. And this is a breakdown of this whole chart. And we're basically seeing that almost 50% of the visitors kind of dropped off and didn't want to buy the product because there was a sales copy problem. If you have a sales copy problem, which I would say majority of the websites do have that issue, here is what I can suggest as far as developing a better sales copy. Here, this is on our Pinterest page. The Mario is your customer. This is a flower. I'm going to just refer to it as a mushroom. It doesn't really matter. The super mushroom is your product, right? You're basically saying, look, customer, if you eat my mushroom, you're going to become this super Mario with fireballs, right? To do whatever you have to do. And a lot of times when you write sales copy, you're just talking about the product. So you're talking about the bullet points, features, the factual data, the specifications, but you don't really talk about the customer. You're basically saying, hey, customer, here is the features of my product but you're not saying how you're going to become this super customer now with all these new tools. So the way the sales copy has to be repositioned is you have to make believe that the customer already bought your product and you have to talk about him using that product on your sales copy. This is the only way you're going to improve this particular score here. So if you want to eliminate this, this is what needs to happen. Now, in order for this to happen, you really need to be a good copywriter. And again, either you learn how to do it or you're going to hire somebody to do it for you. Of course, if you have thousands of products, that's not very practical, which is why you're probably going to have a very high number of this. The other option, if you don't have a lot of products, then you know, you're in luck and you can really focus on that and improve that. That's as far as sales copy. The other thing is a lot of times you're going to write a sales copy about your story, which is great, but this is really more for your about us section, not about your customer. Again, the story that you wanna create on the sales copy should be more about your customer using the product versus why you developed this product and why it's so great. Because if you're telling the customer about the story, you're basically talking about how you created this super mushroom, not how the customer is gonna be using that super mushroom, which is your product. Bottom line is, is this, you're either going to sell the product in five minutes or you're going to burn. So if you can't sell yourself on your sales copy on your product page within five minutes, which is the longest that anybody's going to ever spend on your product page, you're pretty much going to lose that customer. Even with our company, Shopping Court Elite, we spend a lot of time creating videos and sales copy and all kinds of things for our website. And our best customers will not spend more than f between four and seven minutes on the website at a time, which means it doesn't matter how engaging your copy will be, you have a limited time to engage with that visitor. Understanding that point, right, we're all going to lead this up to why conversions need to be there before you can start marketing. Because if the conversions are not there, then your marketing campaign is going to fail. Features versus benefits. You know, features is features of your product. Benefits is how your customer is going to use those features. And you most likely have to t imagine a story about how he's going to use it. Conversion ratio optimization. We covered just now that if you do have traffic, that's great because now you could actually look at it from a different point of view, not just as numbers, but actually what people are doing using threat engagement analytics. On the second slide, we were talking about that you might have a broken sales funnel. And in most customer consulting sessions that I've done, it all leads back to the sales copy is the biggest issue of every website. So finally here is what can we do about this whole thing? 
engagement, engagement, engagement. That should be the goal. Again, I covered this in uh, the previous webinar, but the bottom line is if the customer is engaging, this should be the focus of anything you do that has to do with conversion ratio optimization. The more people you can have engage, the more likely you're going to make a sale. And rethinking your sales funnel. So I'll use another customer as an example. Recently, Joanne, she's actually on our webinar today. So Joanne sells bikes for individuals who may be heavyweight, so over 200 pounds. She has many different bikes. They're all very expensive, anywhere between $1,500 and $3,000. The time for a sale could take 30 days for the bike to be sold. And in addition, there is confusion on which bike do I need because there's many different bikes that you can buy. And this is Joanne's analytics. What we're noticing here is there's really not a sales copy problem. There is a product selection problem, right? That what T is predicting. Why all of a sudden the product selection filter is triggered. And that is because people are interested in this product, but they can't even get to the proper sales copy to be sold on because they don't know what to buy. So yes, they can call and find out, but they have no idea what they should choose. So they're kind of looking, 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 and then they're leaving because you only have four minutes to engage and people who are interested in potentially buying the product, they have no idea what they need. So what I told Joanne, I said, look, we need to rethink your sales funnel, right? You're not selling diapers. You're selling an expensive product that takes 30 days to sell. You're leading people into the product page and they have no idea which one they need. So they leave the product page, which means that if you focus your full attention on the sales copy, that's kind of pointless because they don't even know what to buy. So you can't really sell a product if they don't even know which product they need. So there's a few problems, right? We have this really good engaged traffic because if we go to her store and click on details, we can see that out of 1,500 people, we had 372 engagements with one sale, right? So what happened to the other 371 engaged visitors? And obviously, you know, we can see what happened to them. Poor sales copy, poor product selection. What needs to be done? What I advised is right now you're doing sales first. So you're saying buy my product because it's great. And then maybe you want to give me your email for a newsletter. Maybe you want to do Facebook and come in my social media. Maybe you want to call me. So the attention is buy my product, but I just pointed out that, well, not me, but T quickly pointed out that this will never happen, right? If you continue on this path, the business is going to probably fail. What I suggested is let's do email first, and maybe that's not even the right answer. Maybe it should be call me first and then lead that to a phone sale versus an online sale. But if you don't want to do phone sales, I say do email first and sale later. Why email first, sale later? Again, let's go back to this door. Once we have the email address of these 372 people, assuming that we can fix our sales funnel to show them which product they need to select, we can remarket to them, right? We can email them as many times as we need to, bringing them back to the website so they are reminded that they need to make the purchase. So if we know that it takes 30 days before a sale occurs, and how do we know that? Well, if we're just starting from scratch, and 30 days later, a sale triggers. Well, now we know that this many visitors from 30 days ago triggered this particular sale. Usually, I just make it easier and I just say measure day by day after a predicted time for a sale to occur, which means get the same traffic, let's say, seven days. And on the seventh day, see how many sales you got. Take that ratio for now. Going back to this particular scenario, 372 people. We have no emails for them. We have no way to reconnect with them. We have no way to ask them what happened. If we did not have T, we, we have T, so know what happened. So now we need to rethink our sales funnel on how can we remarket to these people after we help them make a decision. And sometimes decision process can be so long. Example is, again, with Shopping Credit Lead, that you need to remarket to them many times until they can reach a decision. Here is what I recommended. Before we even look into email, let's work on helping them make a decision. So then we said, what can we do? And Joanne went and she thought about it and she ended up with this big thing where it's eight questions that they need to answer and based on their answers, they're gonna be led to a video and they're gonna watch a video. Before they watch a video, they're gonna provide their email address so she can re-engage with them on that specific product. I came back and I said, good idea, but maybe it could get better because if you ask them questions before the email, some people might drop off and not even answer the questions, which means the engagement 
will be lower. So I said, instead of asking for the email after the questions are answered, let's make a video and I'll show you an example where you come on the website, there is a video, you can provide an email to watch it, otherwise you can't watch the video. And by providing an email, we capture email address and basically it could be something along the lines of if you're not sure which bicycle you need or some other, you know, hypey message, then watch this video and everything about this website will be watch this video. So it doesn't matter where the customer is going to land on the website. It's going to be all about you need to watch this video before you can proceed. Are we going to lose customers because they don't want to provide their email or they don't want to watch this video? Probably. But the amount of people you lose now by not capturing their email, you're losing more money that way because you're not going to ever make a sale on those people unless you re-engage with them. You'll still win more business because the people that will provide their email are serious enough to, to make a purchase possibly. So I said, get the email first. Then after they watch the video, you already got their email, so we don't need to ask them again. Let them fill out the questions, and then they can go to another video. Now, assuming that the people will not engage, with the other video or not fill out the questions, we can then put them into an autoresponder and then tell them, hey, you should fill out the questions because we'll tell you which bike you should get. And then if they do fill out the questions, next autoresponder can be, this is the bike you should get and so on. And next thing you know, instead of losing all 300 engaged visitors, we might engage with 20 or 50 of them. Those can turn into sales potentially. So if you're doing sales first, Instead of email first, maybe you can do email first. You could also consider doing video first versus email first. So watch a video, provide an email, or maybe you want to show them a video, then ask them for the email. But by asking them for their email, you now increase the chance of a sale to occur, which means that your conversions will ultimately increase on the engagement you know, over time. But when you're buying traffic, this will also increase the amount of money you can spend to acquire a lead, right? Because... If you know that you're going to get X amount of engaged visitors and then a sale will occur after X amount of days, well, now you can make bigger bets and invest more into getting excellent engaged visitors and, and getting those emails. This all applies to if your life cycle to a sale is more than a day. So if it takes two days for a sale to occur or three or whatever, this has to be implemented. Otherwise, you're literally leaving money on the table. It's 100%. It's not even a maybe. The other thing that I would recommend as far as conversions is some people that I speak to come off as, hey, I'm following the best practices, I know what I'm doing, and I don't need to change my ways. Unless you come in to this whole thing with the approach that I really don't know anything instead of I know everything, you'll actually be able to make better decisions. Using the example of this client, he said, I think my sales copy is fine while I told him that his sales copy is horrible. He didn't agree with me, so I said, well, why don't you go to your product page, forget everything you know about your product and your company, just land on the product page with a fresh look, and imagine that you have $2 million on hand and you are looking to buy out a company, and this is the company you are considering, and the only thing that will convince you to buy this company is that particular sales copy that you've landed on. Will you really invest a million dollars in this company? And after he looked at it, he agreed with me that it's not very good and it could definitely be improved. Just go into this conversion optimization with knowing nothing and then you'll finally be able to kind of leave your bubble and experience what the customer is experiencing. Let's jump into the formula and I'll explain how we predict what your budget should be and so on. There's three parts of the formula. What you have now, so this is the traffic you have now based on the first slide in the PowerPoint I was asking, like, what do you have now? This will show us if there is room for optimization in order to increase the pay-per-click budget. And then there is the actual pay-per-click budget. I'm going to share this formula with everyone. I'll probably make a link below the video when I publish the video and you can play with the formula. This is how many visitors you have. I'm going to actually plug in Joanna's numbers since she's here. This will help her. I think that because the life cycle on this is actually 30 days, let's just look at the longest period we can and that's it. Total visitors that are real, I'm going to just mix the suspicious and the real together. So we had 874 plus 203 is 1077. 
and we had engagements, 352 engagements, and we had one sale. One sale, average sale 1,500, 40% profit margin. Okay, so here's what we have so far. If Joanne had to buy this traffic from Google, as is, right? Because technically she, you know, she'd have to buy some traffic. So let's assume Google will send her exactly this traffic and she wants to spend 50%, see the 50% cap. If she wants to sp spend 50% of her profits to acquire that sale, meaning that she wants to keep $300 in profit for herself, she's going to have to buy that traffic at most at 28 cents a click. So if she's saying, I want to spend 17 cents, well, basically this is the cap. You shouldn't buy it at the cap. You should buy it at lower than your cap. So the cap is 28 cents. Now, Google is probably not going to sell that kind of traffic at 28 cents. They're probably going to want at least 50 cents, 60 cents, and so on, which means that even if she was to give Google 100% of her profits, she'll basically meet her PPC spend and not make any money. So we have 1,000 visitors. Let's just round the numbers off. 350 excellent engaged visitors, one sale. So if we were to buy this traffic, we would have to spend 60 cents per visitor before the sale would occur, and we would make no money because we're giving away 100% of that profit to Google. So let me put this back to 50%. So should Joanne start advertising with pay-per-click? I mean, if she wants to lose money, sure, she can do that. Should she start advertising with you know, organic SEO or Facebook or whatever? Same story. You know, Even if she gets organic, it's going to cost her money to get organic and she'll get more traffic, but she's still not going to explode her sales because she has a bad sales funnel. One more thing. When you hire an advertising agency, this is the only thing they go by. They go by how many visitors they bought and how many sales you made. They don't track engagement. They don't track what your profits are. They just track this, visitors and sales. And because they need time for these visitors to come in, they might at best review it once a week. But in most cases, they will review it once a month to make their adjustments, which is why they usually advertise, let's spend a few thousand dollars, but don't expect any good return in the first month because we need to kind of fine tune the traffic. What we do with T is we now have a new metric. We have engagement levels, right? So why does engagement matter? For two reasons. Number one is we can see how much junk traffic we bought assuming that our sales funnel is good and we shouldn't have any issues with it. If I had to pay 60 cents or 30 cents, whatever, for this thousand people and only 350 engaged, well, what happened to my other 650? What, what happened to my other traffic that I bought? Why did I pay money for that? And why do you keep buying that traffic? Now, sometimes we can't do anything about it because if we cut off some of the poor engaged traffic, the excellent engaged will be lost, but there's ways to segment it out, meaning, one of the reports that C can provide is it can say, look, your East Coast traffic between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. is producing excellent engagement, but West Coast traffic for that same time frame, 4 a.m. or something on the West Coast, that's producing poor engagement. But once West Coast gets 7 a.m., then the engagement goes up. So the segmentation can be done on geographic level, on landing page level, on the time of the day, on the actual day, and so on. And C can provide a report for the marketing agency to make those decisions, which allows them to just shut down the traffic that's not converting very well and lowering your wasted ad spend. The other thing with engagement is that instead of measuring how many visitors we need before a sale could occur, because this is not true, right? Because if I'm going to buy another thousand visitors, what guarantee do I have that those thousand will engage the same way, right? If I'm buying a whole different word and I'm not measuring engagements, how do I know that the next thousand and the next thousand and the next hundred thousand will engage the same way? It's a gamble. Unless you're measuring that, there is no way for you to, to tell. So what I'm suggesting is that you should measure engagement, not visitors, because that's what leads to a sale. Visitors do not lead to a sale. Engagement leads to a sale. Fortunately, for us to measure engagement, we don't need to get the guy to put in his credit card and make a sale. We just need him to browse the website like he's interested to buy the product, which means we can measure engagement by the minute if we needed to. In most cases, you probably don't need that because you don't have a big enough advertising budget, but we have clients who might spend $300,000 per month, and one day for them is, a, is an $8,000 spend, so they want to track every minute and every hour to make sure that the campaign is performing.
for a smaller spend, $5,000 or something like that, you could track by the day. It's, it's not a problem. The formula here is, at least for Joanna's store, is that if we buy 350 visitors, we will make one sale. Now, I'm saying that you're converting at 0.29% of your engaged traffic, which is absolutely horrible. Something that I would consider poor is 5%, something decent is 10%, and it should be capped. At least try your best to get to 20%, right? So what I'm saying is that with that exact same traffic, without spending a penny more to buy traffic right now, at 10%, you're supposed to get 20 sales. Even if we can't get that high of a percentage, which I think you can if you do the sales funnel right, but let's just say that we increase it to 2% of the high engaged traffic. So we get four sales. Now look what happens as soon as we do that. And by the way, I also said that we had a lower engagement, less people actually engaged. Why did I lower this? Because when you first buy traffic from Google, you have no idea what you're buying. Who is going to guarantee you that you're going to get 35% engagement? Eventually, that would be the goal to get there. But in the beginning, it could be a low number. It could be 10% or 20%. This should be monitored daily in the beginning. And you can fine tune it so you can shut down the words that are not producing engagement and leave the words that are. But I'm assuming, look, even at 20% engagement at a 2% conversion, right? So we haven't bought any traffic yet. We just increased the conversion because we improved the sales funnel. We got four sales. And even if we invest 50% of the net profit from each sale, now our cap to buy traffic is $1.20, which means we can actually, if we're paying only 50 cents for that traffic while our cap is $1.20, well, guess what? We can get two for one. We're actually buying more traffic than we need to to ensure that we stay profitable in this whole thing. Let's just say that this is your cap. So then if we do get to this point where our conversion is 2%, now we're saying, okay, what should the advertising budget be? The question is, let's say to Joanne, how many more sales do you want to make? And let's say the answer is, I want to make 30 more sales. Based on these numbers, we're saying you need a total of 7,500 visitors. Assuming that I'm going to change this to 50%, the yellow highlights means what you should be changing. And this is adjustable depending on how much money you're willing to give away to acquire the sale. So this is a pay per action cap. If the net profit is $600, then you're willing to give away 300 to acquire that sale. So anyway, based on the formula, this is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that at a $3,700 budget and at a $1,500 management fee, that this is assuming that, let's say, our company will do the management for this whole thing and you have to do nothing except use this formula and move forward, we should be able to acquire 30 sales. The total spend is going to end up being $5,200. In order for us to meet the numbers in the formula, we should be capped at $9,000, which means that if we do meet this spend, then we spend half of what we were supposed to to acquire the sales that you wanted to. And then we have the red flags for you to watch this thing daily to make sure that you don't go over budget because the second you hit a red flag then you're going to start losing money so in this case i'm saying that if you hit 300 dollars and you're still not making a two percent conversion which is two sales then you have a problem the only problem with doing this for joanne's store is that she doesn't see the sales the first day or the second day, right? If her life cycle is 30 days, that means that she's going to spend this money with the assumption that 30 days later, she's going to start seeing those sales come in, especially if she ended up getting the email addresses for the people and they're in the autoresponder and the sales funnel is working. So just because I'm saying that you need to have 200 engaged visitors and you're going to convert 2%, the question is 2% in what period? It's not going to be the same day. It's going to take 30 days. This formula is important because if it's going to take you 30 days to measure something and I'm telling you that, hey, you should spend $5,000 and then wait 30 days or more to see something for a small business, this is a big investment. I mean, this is crazy. Who here is going to pay $5,000 to someone who's going to say, here is the budget. Let's give it a shot and see what happens, especially if they don't know what they're doing, which is why it's important that this formula is done together. I'll show you the services we offer. We do offer the services to create this whole sales funnel marketing plan with this formula together for you and the marketing agency. But the bottom line is you need to have this formula. You need to agree with it. You need to understand it. You need to be a part of creating these red flags 
and then you need to make sure that whoever is hired is accountable for those red flags. Because if they are not monitoring those flags, then this formula is a waste because it's not being followed and they can do whatever they want. The other thing is with this formula is that assuming that it can be followed very, very carefully and assuming that your sales funnel is good enough where you're happy with your optimization. I'll use Shopping Carlita as an example here. There's always room for improvement, don't get me wrong, but I'm pretty happy with our website's conversions. We have a pretty healthy ratio, which is engagements versus appointments versus how many sales happen at the end of the day. And I feel comfortable spending even $20 pay-per-click because I know that at the end of the day, it's going to pay off. Of course, I'll try to buy the traffic as cheap as I can and not $20 a click, but that's why we do email marketing. That is more like 10 cents a click for us. But using this formula, I don't need to worry about the optimization side of it. I just need to worry about how much money am I going to spend to acquire X amount of customers and how much money will be frozen, right? Because if it takes 60 days for me to get a conversion and it takes a week to get an appointment, then there will be money frozen in this whole thing. If I'm doing, let's say, marketing and I get zero appointments with zero sales today, I don't panic because I just go to my reports and look at my engagement and see if the engagements are there and, and that's fine because I'm not measuring it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm measuring it over a certain period and I'm using engagement as my metric versus a sale. Going back to the PowerPoint, I'm saying that poor conversions will affect your ad budget and using the other client's store that I was just looking at, not Joanne's, but this one here. He was saying, let's buy more traffic. I'm saying, no, let's improve your conversions because we're going to buy more traffic. It's going to be a waste because your conversions are not healthy. If we do end up with good conversions, then we create an opportunity to have a higher ad spend and we lower the risk of that campaign failing. And using the formula, we can predict what the advertising budget should be. And we could understand the engaged visitors to sales ratio. We can see what's our net profit versus how much we're willing to spend to get that sale, pay per action, and what the assumed pay per click cost will be. So when we are talking to our pay per click agency, we can actually tell them do not buy traffic for more than 50 cents or, or 60 cents unless you're going to guarantee me that I have excellent engagement. Because don't forget on the formula that I have here, I'm saying that if you don't know what you're buying, the cap should be a dollar twenty, assuming that you have a twenty percent engagement level. But if you're buying every single visitor and every single visitor is engaging, well that excellent engaged visitor is actually worth six dollars under this formula. So you can see they're next to each other. So regular visitor is a dollar twenty, excellent engaged visitor is six dollars, which means if you have an opportunity to guarantee an excellent engaged visitor, you know, purchase, it's really worth six dollars to you. You can use this formula to basically improve your conversions ultimately. So if I'm saying that in this case, you're converting at 0.29% and this is horrible and you should be at least at 10. Well, you know, if you want to kind of take baby steps, you can start off with a small number and just say 1% or 2% and see how far you can get. Going to the very beginning of the PowerPoint, that's where rethinking your sales funnel comes in. If you're not converting, that's the fact. That's not an opinion. And I'm telling you right now that if your customers are taking more than a day to decide if they want to buy your product or not, then you should not continue doing what you're doing where sales comes first and everything else comes later. You have to put a buffer between either email or video or something that will get them to give you their emails so you can remarket to them. Hiring for conversions. We put together, this is on csoftware.com, under services, we have two options. Now, keep in mind, the options are not cheap. I encourage you, if you can, to try to do it yourself. Even though I've tried with many people and they just can't, I probably should rule that out. That <laughs> You probably will have a hard time, especially if you're busy during the day. The other option is if you have somebody in-house, then you know let them give it a shot. But bottom line is there's two services here. One of them, which I highly recommend, is the breakdown to do the formula analysis, to do the sales funnel analysis, conversion analysis, advertising budget analysis, and put together a new marketing plan of how to move forward. So again, using an example for Joanne, she came to us and she said, well, I think I want to do social media. I spoke to her and I said, well, why social media? Why not something else? And she didn't really have an answer. So I said, 
what is the problem? And then we started looking at C and we came to the conclusion that social media is not going to help. In fact, nothing will help until we improve the conversions. So the focus should be the conversions improvement. And I gave her the ideas that I shared with you today on what should be done, right? So email first. And before we can get the email first, we need to make the video to allow them to make the decision without calling. So that's where the focus is now for her. And then once that piece is finished for her store, pay-per-click makes a lot of sense because there's enough margin. The campaign will most likely succeed as long as the conversions are in place. For somebody with a smaller margin using the formula, it might not make sense. And at that point, we might have to rethink and get creative with how to get traffic. I mean, email marketing is the cheapest way to get it. But then again, you need a list and the list can either be bought or use the list in-house. Anyway, bottom line is that if you need a plan, a report, an analysis, and all of this just put together for you, this would be the service for that. Keep in mind, this is just a report. So this is going to be sort of like a plan with a report, with analysis, with formulas, nothing else. There's no physical work being done. If you want to physically improve the conversions, go from 0.29 to 2% or 10% by implementing that plan. This is a very dynamic service. I really wasn't sure how to price it out because it really could involve redoing sales copy, which professionally done, it could be like $100 per article. Redoing the graphics might involve a developer and a CSS person and redoing images and coding. So I wasn't sure how to price it out. We decided on a price of $150 an hour to execute different parts of the plan. And usually within 20 to 30 hours, we can increase the conversions by a lot. Again, this is more of a case by case basis. So if you're interested, you can inquire about it. I guess the first thing would be do the report. The second thing would be to get an estimate of what needs to be physically done and how much is it going to cost because most likely you need multiple parties involved in doing this. Consultant is just to do a report, and then you have the option of full service consulting. The other option is to do it yourself. So do it yourself. I recommend a website called Marketing Experiments. They increase conversions. That's all they do all day long. I don't know how much they charge, to be honest, but I read their articles periodically. They are good. I can recommend that you try that out and, and see what they say and maybe you can come up with ideas. The other option is what I usually do is I actually try to position myself into the customer's shoes and I open up the threat engagement analytics, I open up the screenshots and I keep looking at them with a fresh eye, blanking everything out that I know and just trying to imagine you know, why they did what they did. Of course, me having marketing knowledge, I can come up with some ideas on what to improve. So if you're the type of person that can do it yourself or you have a marketing background or you have somebody in-house that can do it, then you can give it a shot. The other thing that I actually advised to Joanne, because she couldn't figure out how to create a sales copy, and most likely if she can't figure it out, I doubt anybody she hires can figure it out. So I recommended for her to go to a website called emyth.com and take their course, specifically the first two lessons. Basically on Emith, the first two courses is the leadership and the branding. Both of these kind of tap into your head for you to understand what your company is about, what your product is about, how you want others to perceive your product and so on. And this will really give you a lot of ideas of how to position your company, your brand and your product. I recommend for you to give it a shot if you completely go blank on this. But ultimately, if you just want fast results and you just want to get things done, I recommend doing the report first. Then we can get a better idea of what needs to be done and you can at least have a plan as well as a budget to look forward to. And by the way, I, I kind of didn't touch on the other thing. I touched on the conversion optimization. There's also PPC marketing. So the PPC marketing is to set up your campaign. This you don't really need unless... You know, you're spending a lot and you already have the whole thing set up. So if you have a full campaign set up and you just need somebody to do engagement, you can consider this. It could be done either hourly or depending on your ad spend. PPC setup to set up a brand new campaign, this would be the option. But again, I don't recommend touching this until the formula is done because we don't know what we're marketing. This is just to get traffic. But if we don't know what the engagement is or where the conversions are or what the formula that needs to be followed, it's impossible to do this and actually have it succeed. If you're just starting out, I would recommend to at least either you look or let us look to understand your conversions and put this formula together for you. So going back to benchmarks, you need to set up a schedule how long it should take 
for you to achieve certain results. There needs to be a score chart day by day, literally day by day. We're going to measure how much engagement we got today, how much sales we got today. Everything for that day that has to do with advertising spend will be tracked and the benchmarks will come into play by we need to say that by let's say a week from now we need to be at this point and if we're not we need to completely go back and rethink what we're doing we could set up hourly or daily red flags again this would be entered into the score chart and it would be reviewed on a day-to-day -day basis i recommend that on the first month just so the agency can have some room to play with i'd recommend that you go with a hundred percent net profit sharing on your pay-per-click budget, meaning we will be fine if we just break even the first month without making a penny of net profit, as long as we don't lose money, because we need to tweak their campaigns. It's gonna be very hard for us to get it right the first time because it's not that simple. So we are estimating that to start a campaign, we would need to do the report, which could cost a thousand dollars. We would need to do optimization on the website, which could cost a few thousand if needed. Maybe it's not needed, but maybe it is needed. I guess let's just use Joanne as an example because I already know about her store. So Joanne's situation is like this. She did the report, right? And then she needs to do the optimization because her conversions are horrible. The optimizations on her store, the videos alone could cost $5,000 without even doing anything else. Whatever it takes needs to be invested into conversions. And T is going to show you proof that it worked or it didn't work. If you can increase X amount of sales, you will recover your investments. So that shouldn't really be a concern because... You can't really touch it, but you can see it, right? Like you can actually, like a video, you can see it. Sales copy, you can see it. It's physical labor that was done for your business and it becomes an asset of your business. Traffic, you buy it. And unless we get an email from them, then it's not a real asset. So the question is, how big is the risk and how big is the reward? If Joanna needs to invest $5,000 into videos and ultimately, let's say she ends up spending 10000 to do this whole conversion thing, is that worth it? Was it worth investing $10,000 to then see two sales in that period instead of one sale? How long is it going to take to recoup that investment? And is she really doing this to just increase the conversions today? Or is she doing this because there's a bigger picture where she'll do advertising to get those numbers? If the risk versus the reward does not pay off, well, keep working it until it pays off. So you're either going to find a way or you're going to find an excuse that it doesn't work. You just need to make sure that the reward outweighs the risk. You can do that by creating pros and cons. The other thing that you can do is a, like a cheat sheet workaround is go to spyfu.com and look at the competitors that might be competing with you to see what they did over the years. With SpyFu, this is usually done by your advertising agency, or if you hire us to do the full campaign, we would do it for you. Anyway, it's not loading. You can check it out later yourself. But with SpyFu, it shows you who bought what ads for how long. Did they stop buying the ads? Are they continuing to buy ads? And most likely, if your competitor is buying ads and he's been buying the same one for a year, most likely it's paying off. So you can kind of lower your risk by copying your competitor versus starting from complete scratch. Then let's assume that you did the report you know you need to spend, let's say, ten or $20,000, whatever it is. You figure out that you can possibly get that money and you'll be able to do this whole thing. So you need to go through a mental preparation. The reason why I'm relating to this because I had to go through this, <laughs> this whole thing myself when we were doing our advertising budget. There's a book called Everything Store, talking about Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. And whatever risks Jeff takes, he usually takes them with a 70% chance of failure. <laughs> I know that's not a very good way to do things, but that's how he takes his risks. I mean, I think that for the mental preparation, I think you have to be in that position where you're going to go into this with a very high chance that it might fail, you might lose the money, and you'll need to be able to recover yourself because if you are going to invest every last penny and then go bankrupt if something goes wrong, you probably should reconsider taking that position. I usually say, well, it's not me who said it, it's Jim Collins, I think, said it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Bullets first, then cannonballs. So before you start shooting cannonballs, it's a story that he said that there was two ships, there was a very large fog, the captain of one of the ships, he only had one shot with a cannonball, and he was so confident that he's going to get the ship, so he fired that cannonball, and he misses by 30 feet. So then the other ship saw Cannonball come 30 feet away, 
and they decided to take their guns out and start shooting into the fog slowly. Not everybody is shooting the same direction, but everybody would shoot into one specific direction until they would hear screams and somebody actually got hit. So when they finally shot and somebody got hit, that's when they fired their cannonball and they were able to hit the ship and sink it. So before you shoot out a cannonball, you should probably shoot some bullets first to make sure that you have a hit and then you can shoot the cannonballs. What I mean by that is that if I'm telling you you need a ten or twenty thousand dollar advertising budget, you don't have to spend all ten and twenty thousand dollars in one shot and be broke. That's why you have benchmarks, that's why you have red flags, that's why you're measuring it day by day. You can always say that, look, I'm willing to spend $20,000, but I'm not going to spend all in one month. I'm going to basically do a seven-day benchmark to make sure that I can at least meet the red flags. Let's say that you do seven days and it totally fails, 0% on everything. So you have to pause it, not waste the rest of the money, go back to the table and figure out and retry it again. So the agency can still be involved, but we will know exactly when to press the pause button. And it could even be on one day or two days. We're not measuring how many sales we're going to get. We're measuring engagement. So we can even do tests day by day until the engagement ratio is perfect and then shoot the cannonball and then see what happens over the week or over the month. You need to also set an end vision of the campaign. You can't just look at your $20,000 and look at all the negatives of how broke you will be when you lose all that money. You also have to look at what's going to happen, what is going to succeed and what's going to happen to your business and to your lifestyle and so on. And again, assuming that you've done the formula correctly and you're measuring it on a day-by-day -day basis and you're physically involved, you're not depending on somebody else to be involved, there's no reason why your end vision can't be met. And finally, milestones and benchmarks on when to revisit that vision that you would be setting up. Campaign preparation, you need to get the right team. You cannot do this yourself. I mean, I don't even do this whole thing myself. This is absolutely crazy to do it yourself. So you need somebody to do ad management. You need somebody to do engagement management. You need to have somebody who knows how to increase conversions. I said graphic designer because the graphic designer is always involved when it comes to the website. You need these four people. With the T software, the management services that I was showing you, that's a full service job. That's an ad optimizer, that's engagement optimization, that's a conversion expert. So all of them would come into play. You can consider it. It's not cheap, but that's because this whole thing is not cheap. If you want to do it right, it's going to cost money and it has to have proper planning, which is why we designed it that way, that planning first, and then we can do everything else. Sometimes it's not even possible to do this whole thing because you just physically don't have access to that kind of money to invest into the business, so that's out of the question. But assuming that there is a way to access to that money, then we can plan this whole thing out. And for some businesses, $10,000, $20,000 is a lot of money. For some, it's something that they spend every day. So depending your situation, like I said, everybody's different. Everybody has different products, different average sales, different net profits. It's different for everybody. It has to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. I also recommend that if you do go into this, you understand the basics. I never encourage you to go into something this big with this big of a budget without first understanding who does what and at least playing with it yourself to, to really understand who needs to be doing what because you're technically the leader in this whole thing. You have managers and you have workers, but you need to finalize that vision and finalize those milestones and you need to understand the basics. So the basics could be how to use T understanding the reports that we would put together for you, understanding the basics of pay-per-click, of what the ad optimizer is going to be doing, understanding the benchmarks, understanding the score chart, putting a project leader in charge in the score chart. It could be you or, or a manager internally. Meet as often as possible. Don't just let this thing run for a month and meet a month later and say, why did it fail? You need to meet daily if needed the first month and then weekly the second month. And You need to keep monitoring this whole thing until it goes autopilot. I will assume that if you're spending this much money on a campaign, this big, you'll probably want to do this monitoring as often as possible until it's autopilot. Finally, to optimize the campaign, this is what's involved. You need to monitor the ROI reports. It's not this report, it's this report. We have an ROI report in C, which basically shows you, let me just open this one up. What was your average sale? What was your conversions for that day? Which keywords visited? which ones should be dropped, which ones are not, and the segmentation report. Usually this report is monitored by an advertising agency. 
if you're doing it yourself, which I don't think anybody should, they should definitely get a team together for this whole thing. This report needs to be monitored. Visitor behavior needs to be monitored for somebody who's measuring engagement. You need to monitor the score chart for your red flags. You need to constantly keep seeing if there's a way to improve your conversions. Stop the bad traffic and set up a red flag that if you have red flags go off for X amount of days, then you have to pause the whole project and rethink about the whole project and then relaunch it. Otherwise, you're going to risk losing your whole investment. You definitely don't want to be in that position. I know this is a lot of info. Again, you can rewatch it on the YouTube channel. It's going to be under webinars, under the Shopping Corley channel. If you are going to want to proceed with doing any of this, like I said, the first service should be the conversion report to understand what you have and what's needed and make sure that your sales funnel is in place and so on. And then after that, we will advise you what you should do and you can make your decisions who you want to hire. You can either hire us, you can hire someone else, you can hire someone in-house, you can do it yourself. It's going to be totally up to you, but the report is something that I would highly encourage everyone to do if you're planning on doing this. So this is the end of the webinar. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Somebody asked about the formula. I'm going to put the formula link as an Excel sheet underneath it, so you'll be able to download it and play with it yourself if you like. It looks like we have a few people that are not on Shopping Card Elite yet, so Threat Engagement Analytics is built into Shopping Card Elite. You can go to shoppingcardelite.com, check it out. It's under Overview, under T. You can read about it. I also recommend that you read about under the section Optimize. There's a bunch of best practices, which actually is supposed to be followed by somebody who does conversions. There's also a bunch of consulting sessions that I've done. No, they're not here. They're on this playlist here. So you have a few different consulting sessions that I've done. I posted them here if you want to watch them. I think that's all as far as learning more about T specifically. Somebody asked about sales copy. So... If you go to Shopping Carly T, right under Optimize, there's right here, it says Optimize Product Web Pages. It says click here. If you click here, it actually has everything that you need to know about sales copy. What's interesting about these articles is I had so many people ask me the same questions. On how do I fix certain parts? And I got tired of answering the same question over and over again with the same response. So I just wrote these articles, every possible thing that I would do to optimize that specific section. And that is where that's located. So I would encourage you to check it out. Also, if you visit our Pinterest page, I think this article here is located under the interesting articles boards. This is a very interesting article about sales copy also. Definitely should read it if you were doing sales copy optimization. It talks about different companies and how they are doing their features versus benefits. I would encourage you to check this out.